Have you ever come across the term panspermia? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's the idea that um, rocks or meteorites from somewhere else hit here and that they were, uh, they contained biological material. Yeah. And then the radical part is where I am. And, but I come by it honestly. I'm pretty good friends. I'd say I'm very good friends and have been for over a decade with the world's most prominent panspermist. Hmm. And he is coming. You will meet him at the Cosmic Summit, Dr. Chandra Wickramasinghe. All right. And he is a, I think, the world's greatest living scientist. And one way you can tell that is you don't know his name. But if you go back and look, he published 70 papers in Nature from 1970 to about 82 or so with Sir Fred Hoyle, who was the great greatest scientist of the 20th century in, um, in Great Britain. And they were at Cambridge. And Chandra was actually so intelligent that the queen gave him a scholarship, an empire scholarship, to come from Sri Lanka as a boy. And he got on a steamship and was delivered to England as one of the most intelligent people in the empire. They had like a scholarship program. So they, you know, England ruled the world and they say, who's the smartest ones out there? We'll let them come to mm -hmm. Cambridge or Oxford. So Chandra was able to as a young boy and he was kind of delivered into the hands of Sir Fred Hoyle. And they, um, Fred had defined how the sun works. And then they discovered and published that what was cosmic um, dust out there, gigantic dust clouds out in interstellar space, mm -hmm. That um, that that dust was actually organic molecules, right? Which is the as they say, and I hate this term, the building blocks of life. That's all that the, uh, uh, you know, the God. What do you call them? Bi Astrobiologists. Mm -hmm. Well, they're always looking for the building blocks of life. They're right. never looking for life. Always mm -hmm. building blocks. So. And, and they defined that and said, holy cow, well, this stuff is not just dust. It's not little pieces of graphite. It's actually, you know, carbon-based molecules just like life is. And, and then it stopped there. The, their changing of what we understand is out there, but they didn't stop. Fred and Chandra went on and said, we went and took the spectra. And Steve, you might search Mustafa spectra panspermia. <laughs> we just stop it. That's right. And we'll see if we can get it. Um, they went and looked at one and then images. Yes, sir. Oh, God. Okay. Uh, put in, um, I hate to do this mm. to you, but put in, what, put in Hoyle instead of Wick Ramasing. Instead of what? Um, uh, yeah. Hoyle. I'm going to find it. Yeah, Hoyle. I just want what they did. Hoyle or Hoya? Uh, H O um, H O Y L E. Okay. There it is. Okay, see that little graph on the second row? Second row. Far right? Uh, far right. Yeah, that's, that's Comet Halley. They also did it to other places. Okay. Okay. Is that? I can't quite see. But the other ones, ah, yes, what they see. did is they tested the spectra from interstellar clouds and they match E. coli, among mm -hmm. other things. Hmm. Bacteria. Exactly. So you've got the spectra there of bacteria laying upon the spectra. There you go. The prediction for bacteria. bacteria yeah. And then the light that they see from these giant clouds. Well, what are the odds that it matches? So then they said, that's life. And then people all of a sudden, oh, you can't have life in space. No, nah, man. No, 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 no. We're not talking about little... There are huge classes, and we discover more and more of, of microorganisms that have the ability to um, survive incredible conditions, that streamophiles. Mm -hmm. And first of all, why the hell would evolution in, in, endow them with the ability to survive the vacuum of space and radiation, et cetera, and so forth? But they go into hibernation. Not only that, um, so they could be out there in a just-add-water and warmth environment. And it would come back. But I could take you even further. So that's way out there in interstellar space. And maybe you have grains of life out there, which is unbelievable enough and not accepted. But Chandra maintains that it's everywhere in space. Okay, that it is coming in every day, all the time. And here's how. That if you're a speck, and that Comet Halley, for instance, that all comets are seething, boiling, viral containers 
wow. that they're absolutely full of life. And then as they shed dust particles, mm. which float into the atmosphere all the time, and that's all well accepted, little particles, always dust coming in from comets, that within those dust particles, that's how the life is protected, right? Now, it's not living necessarily at the moment, but the dust particle is, a, I don't know, 100,000 times larger, let's say, literally on those scales, mm. than a virus. And that viruses are raining down on the earth constantly and the evolution darwinian evolution is certainly a big factor and a starting point but that evolution has been guided by transmissions of outside uh, molecular dna from space which is coming in all the time and in fact most viral outbreaks are the result the 1918 spanish influenza people were infected in boston on the same day as bombay well, they didn't have jets back then. Really? Yeah. You can't shake hands that fast, right? That there are all sorts of things like that, right? And they wrote paper after paper in Nature, and none of them were adequately refuted, but it was never accepted that life is absolutely omnipotent. You can't get away from it. And I'll give you a great example. The Russians, uh, I'll give you a good one here, Steve. We'll get right to it. Cosmic Tusk. ISS, like International Space Station, Plankton, Cosmic Tusk, which is my website. Mm -hmm. The Russians took, <clears throat> you think they'd have a different kind of specialty tool, but a tampon uh -huh. and swiped that big tourist window on the space station. They've got like a big round one where they can kind of hang out and look down at the earth and stuff. There you go. Microbes entombed in cosmic dust collected from outside surface of the space station window. They swiped it, I think, 10 times in six years. I forget the exact numbers. Every one of them came back with the scum on the outside of the windshield were diatoms, the little... Oh, diatoms. Yeah. yeah. Bacteria, vi viruses, diatomaceous plankton, tar tardigrades, fungi that this stuff is raining down more or less constantly. I'm not sure why I put tardigrades in there. But that was an incredible paper. The Russians published this paper that said that we went and tested their scum outside the space station that is clearly life and it's not contaminated. They were very careful with it and whatnot, right? And what are their choices then? Either it came up, with, and all of them are incredible. Chandra... Yeah. Published 75 papers in Nature yeah, with, with Sir Fred Hoyle in the 70s and 80s. That's right. Saying, yeah. saying all this. Ubiquitous microbes in cosmic dust would ultimately be found. Remember that that particle of dust is orders of magnitude larger than the life particle. So it makes a great little spaceship. Think about a spaceship. You're that tiny little virus and you've got this gigantic dust particle. That's plenty to protect you. Right? Mm. But then you come into the atmosphere that stuff flakes off, then it's a, a free-roaming virus, and it reverse RNAs its way, you know, I guess that's what you call it, um, into the evolutionary stream. And that's why we get dramatic jumps like the Cambrian explosion, where all of a sudden we went from X number of life forms to 10X number of life forms, right? And things like the octopus came along. And this gets to what you're saying, these water worlds. What Chandra would tell you is that everything we see here had an origin somewhere else, DNA-wise, right? So you see that crazy-looking jellyfish, right. and you say, how the hell did a baboon and a jellyfish? Right. Both and all of us wonder that. And what they do is the same thing with geology. They say, well, just give it a lot of time. That makes a lot just, of sense. Just, wow. Yeah, just give it five billion years, and we trust us. You can get a jellyfish on one side and a baboon on the other. And you can't really refute that, okay, I guess, a lot of time, anything can happen. Makes a hell of a lot more sense to me that there is a damn jellyfish world out there, and there is a baboon world out there, and there is a spider world out there, and there's some that are spider-heavy and have some baboons, and maybe mm -hmm. there's some that baboon, you know, that, that, and we're a zoo. We're a zoo 
of life, right. not necessarily a unique one by any means, but some planets might be tilted more towards one kind of thing. It might be more insecty and another one might be more mammals and mm-hmm. so on and so forth. And that that soup is constantly coming in. Wow. And, 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 you know, here's the greatest thing about that paper. Okay, so then the Russians, and I kept looking, somehow I missed it, but I'm like, God, this is going to make worldwide news. We finally discovered life in space. And because it was reported, plankton found on outside of space station, and then nothing, crickets, just like always on the really important stuff. And then I found out subsequently, it took a few years, they published a paper in 2018 where they said, we've only got two choices here, the Russians did. They said either it came from above or we it came from below. They did not think it was contaminated at launch, right? That it wouldn't have stayed, that scum wouldn't have. Ah, uh, right. right. And right. the thing was inside the space station window was launched years ago anyway, right? And it's already mm-hmm. been going, whatever. So it didn't, didn't, wasn't on launch. So they said an as yet unidentified mechanism must be whipping, say, the diatoms were traced to the Barents Sea. It had the same kind of diatom you find in a Barents Sea up in the mm-hmm. northern hemisphere. They said they're, they're, the, the ocean waves must whip it into the air, and then some kind of, yet to be fully explained, electromagnetic force lifted it 400 kilometers out into space from the Barents Sea, and mm-hmm. that's why you find it out there. Or... It came from above, and life was absolutely fucking everywhere. And they they hedged, and they kind of went with the other explanation. Okay. That it came, that it, there's some mechanism. Well, first of all, if that mechanism is true, it means life's everywhere. It means we're seeding life. It means panspermia is true either way. Mm-hmm. Either we're sending it out, and other people could catch it, or it's coming down, and we're getting it. Mm. But then it gets even cooler. Then the lead author of the paper that hedged... Little noticed, but very serious paper. All these people had access to shit from the space station. These are not pajama scientists. The Russian, serious Russian scientists with access to very special materials. They hedged. Then TV Grabinikova, one of the lead authors, after the hedged paper, immediately published another paper with Chandra and the panspermis crowd and said, basically, bullshit. I don't believe it. I think it came from above. It's the only reasonable answer. So she switched teams. She went from the neutral team to to Chandra's team, and Chandra's coming to Greensboro next month. And uh-huh. he, you know, he's I think he's eighty five years old. Mm-hmm. And I felt bad about. I was like, Chandra, do you really want to make this trip, man? Because we can have you virtual. Mm-hmm. And he's such a cool dude, man. Wow. He's like, I wouldn't miss it for the world. So he's going to give the keynote at the Cosmic Summit, actually. Yeah, well, I mean, it would make sense that, you know, we're a planet that's packed with life. Why, yeah. why wouldn't we have just tons of of microscopic life and bacteria surrounding us, Yeah, right? Like yeah. coming, I mean, not, I mean, not coming from other places, coming from us, like, right? If we're this big yeah. ball of life, why wouldn't we have little bits of, of microscopic organic material just floating around the outer atmosphere where the space station or at is. least during and this is mainstream starting to accept this at least during impacts when things are kicked into orbit right it would shoot stuff yes. out that way yes i would be curious to see if we've ever uh, you know how any of re, has any research like this been done from any of the rovers or any of the things we've sent to mars oh, oh yeah we tested for life and we found it in 1977 in the viking lander you know that um mm, mm, dr levin Gavin, what Mm -hmm. is his name? The principal investigator, the head guy for testing life, when we landed the Viking landers, published a thing. He's been saying it for 40 years, but he just published in Scientific American about two or three years ago and said, listen, damn it, I ran the life test and we found life. And there is a certain resistance in the field of astrobiology, in my view, is the most fucked up discipline on Earth. It is the most self-defeating timid bunch of bullshitters that ever were they'll never address this stuff they'll only go so far they're only looking for building blocks and then we never test it again there has not been a direct life detection instrument aboard any rover since they can only test for the building blocks 
hmm. because it was ruled out. You know, and here's a good one. Bill Clinton held a press conference in the Rose Garden and Fett said we found life on Mars. Did you know that? I did not know that. Google that one, Steve, because that's on YouTube. Or what, what, what conference? Uh, just Bill Clinton, just type in life Bill, on Mars. Bill Clinton, life on Mars, yeah. Yeah. The, the, what, year, he, what year did you say that? Eh, when he was probably president? 90, yeah, 97 or 98. Like 96 right here. A group of scientists found feet. Oh, you don't see it. Uh, a group of scientists found features of likeness of microscopic fossils of bacteria in a meteorite. Oh, no, that's not it. That's it. That's it. Yeah. There's an immediate right. Suggesting yep. that these organisms also originated on Mars. The claims immediately made headlines worldwide, culminating in the U.S. President Bill Clinton giving a speech about it. We did. The, we discovered life on another planet speech. Hell, the president gave it. Right. Huh. <laughs> well, dude, you can go hit uh, hit videos and, and it'll come up. And you say Bill Clinton says it's a monumental day. We found life on Mars. Oh, look at there. Look at that. I mean, this is not a conspiracy theory. The damn right. president said it. It's a travesty. It's a sociological travesty that somehow... The bureaucracies cannot get past the pursuit of the supposed pursuit of life mm. and go ahead and say, we found it a hundred different ways. There have been all sorts of stuff seems in, in meteorites that suggest right. life, but it's the bar. They, they'll move the goalpost to beyond whatever they did. And they, they beat the hell out of the scientists who brought it to the president. Mm. And they ended up Richard Hoover and those guys had to, they told him to shut the fuck up about it, that they were probably wrong. It could be other things because mm. you see on those in that meteorite, you see these little things that look biological and they come up with any other explanation that would be just as a, it's like discovering life is, so, you know, the old thing that um, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Mm -hmm. That is the most harmful statement in the history of modern science. Mm. Carl Sagan. His, you know, throw ashes on his damn grave. I mean, he said that, and that has now become the go-to place. No, no, you don't need extraordinary evidence for extraordinary claim. You need evidence. There's evidence is evidence is evidence. It doesn't need to be any more extraordinary just because of the claim. Yeah. Now you're going to have to run it down. You're going to have to double check. But it, so now you bring forward any evidence and they say, well, that's just not extraordinary enough. Right. You know? So I don't know. I'm getting into kind of my pet peeves here, and I don't want to get uh, don't want to get like Graham get all angry. At <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but yeah, there's something going on out there where we just can't we can't break through to the truth that's self evident before us.